There's a story that Nick Riggle likes to use as an example in his work. Nick was a big name in professional rollerblading in the late 90s. He competed at a few X Games, invented an entire genre of skating called mushroom blading. Today, I'm an assistant professor of philosophy at the University of San Diego and uh, an author, a writer. The story involves a guy named Jeremy Fry. Jeremy is a wiry kid with glasses and shaggy hair, kind of like a teenaged Bill Gates, but dweebier. Jeremy is sitting in the stands at the Celtics game with maybe his mom? And Bon Jovi's Living on a Prayer starts to play on the loudspeakers. Suddenly, he's on the jumbotron. He was lip syncing and air guitaring and sort of dancing to the song. And he started interacting with the crowd as Bon Jovi. And the crowd sort of took it up and they were there expressing themselves. He was sort of playing around and it created this environment of sort of mutual expression and appreciation through that expression. That is awesomeness. That's the central theme of Nick's book. On being awesome, a unified theory of how not to suck. Being awesome and sucking, for Nick, has become a very distinctively social way we evaluate works of art and acts of expression. For some reason, as I discuss in the book, we adopted the word awesome to talk about the kinds of creative community building that awesome people, in the newfangled sense, achieve. Jeremy Fry is a prototype of awesomeness. He's the creative community builder. He created what I call a social opening. And the social opening gave the rest of the crowd an opportunity to be down and to take up the social opening. So, sucking. What's the relationship between that and awesomeness in your view? Sucking is a matter of failing to take up a social opening for no good reason. So in the middle of this performance, he sort of approaches this one guy and the guy just sort of mimics kicking him and sort of nudges him away. That sucks, right? This guy sucks. And if you look at the YouTube comments, you just see like, he's clearly singled out as like someone who really fails in this social context to, as it were, get it. Nick is a philosopher of art. And as a philosopher of art, Nick thinks that the way we judge the impact of art on a social community is just as important as judging art according to how it affects us when we experience it personally. The value of art isn't wholly encapsulated in its capacity to give me pleasure um, or give you excitement or, or shock. And so when you think about what art does for us, and you move just beyond, ever so slightly beyond the individual, you see like, oh yeah, you know, we can bond over an album, over our love for a podcast. The value that that has for two people or for a subculture isn't just sort of the pleasure it gives all of us. Something about the role that it plays in establishing social relationships? Yeah, yeah, establishing social relationships through the mutual cultivation of of our individuality. And when we recognize broader categories we use to evaluate art, we come to broader categories of art as well. You come to recognize the artistry in rollerblading or skateboarding, for example. Street art is art that uses the street artistically. The street is sort of this vague concept. I think of the street as this cultural space. It's where I can sort of flaunt my style or express my commitments. And to use it artistically is to take that cultural space and highlight its function or enhance its function or augment it in some way. If you think about it, street art has this great advantage in being awesome in a way that paintings in a gallery just don't. They exist in public spaces and are meant to interact directly with the communities that look at it or engage with it. It's a lot easier to create a social opening when the art takes place in a social context. Bruno Taylor, I think, put swings in bus stops. Now, that's a classic piece of street art, on my view, because it's like, here you took this this public street space. You made it easier and more attractive for people to express themselves in public. It's just boring. You sit on a bench and like, wait, so why not have like swings there? Um, stuff to play with. <laughs> um, I think that's just really a wonderful piece of street art. And like, that's the kind of creative community building via art that a city could get in on. Crosswalk design could be more playful. 
thought-provoking, attention-grabbing. These works are, are so interesting because their value seems to consist in something that we'd normally theorize in ethical terms. Empathy, mutual attention, mutual respect even. But we want to say that they're great works. The way that they're great works is that they're awesome. Do you think that we have a dearth or an excess of awesomeness? Uh, I think and there's... do you think we should be actively trying to create it? Yeah, I think, I think we should. Yeah, I think there's a kind of a dearth of awesomeness. Um, there's a dearth of the, of the kind of social risk that you mentioned. The social risk that is a kind of creative risk aimed at community building. The advantage that street art has in being awesome also makes it even more susceptible to sucking. In fact, some of the suckiest things that ever sucked are designed for the street. You find it all over the place. That's actually what today's show is about. Street designs that suck in the sense of Nick Riggle's theory. They're antisocial. They close off social openings. I found street designs that suck so bad that artists feel they have to vandalize them just to bring some humanity and awesomeness back to the street. From Vassar College, you're listening to Hi Fi Nation, a show about philosophy that turns stories into ideas. I'm Barry Lamb. The philosopher Richard Rowland of the Australian Catholic University produced this story for us from the UK. When Leah Borromeo was riding her bike down Kirsten Road in East London one evening, she was looking for something very specific. A bunch of sharpened butt plugs on a flat surface where you could otherwise shelter from the rain or sit down or just chill out. Kirsten Road is in Shoreditch in East London. Shoreditch is now heavily gentrified, but it used to be a poor area filled with old warehouses where artists could afford cheap studios. Kirsten Road today has a very visible homeless population which has been pushed to the margins and pushed to the edges of the area by people with money. Those sort of nooks and crannies and and safe places for people who've suddenly come down on their luck are becoming few and far between. Leia is an artist, a journalist and filmmaker, and erstwhile interventionist. The reason Leia was looking for these sharpened butt plugs, as she put it, was because she had an experience earlier in the day during her lunch break. I was walking to and from lunch and outside one of the supermarkets. There were a couple of women who, you know, would say of advanced years. They had their shopping with them and they wanted to sort of sit down and they found a ledge and they found some spikes on the ledge. And I looked at the spikes and I sort of went, holy, wow. And they were pointy, sharp, sharp and butt pluggy, kind of. And they weren't pleasant, you know. It's, it's like those sort of, you know, beds of nails that kaffirs would be lying on for, for, you know, fun. These things are actually anti-homeless spikes, and they were showing up on flat surfaces all over the city. And I was like, OK, so no, there's nowhere for you to sit. And so I got in this conversation with some of the women there, and, and I have a nasty North American habit of talking to strangers. Someone was like, well, somebody should do something about this. So after work, Claire went cruising on her bike to find a particularly visible set of anti-homeless spikes. She had an idea. Thinking about it on the sort of cycle ride home, I just thought, well, there's, that's a bed of nails. I was like, oh, make it into a bed. I went to a local hardware store and asked them what would the tackiest glue or the tackiest adhesive they had. Give me the one that's the biggest pain in the ass. <laughs> And he's like, oh, right, yeah, yeah. You remember, like, you know, the ones you could, that you can hang cars from on, you know, that kind of, I want that. I went down to my local friendly foam dealer, slathered that on the bottom, and then carted it out. And, you know, bearing in mind, we'd measured all of this. We'd measured the distance between the spikes, and we'd put those holes in the mattresses so it would fit. That thing does not go. In addition to gluing a bed on top of the spikes, Leia installed a library of books and papers about gentrification and housing. So I chose to install a library to give the installation and to give the bed, as it were, that added bit of history and that added bit of context. Uh, Because libraries are safe and neutral spaces, at least in my mind, and they're welcoming places for anybody, 
so university students to esteemed professors to people who just want to get in from the cold. Libraries have always had that kind of, for me, especially if you're, if you're secular, a kind of church-like role. And I thought it was essential to have something that was stocked full of books and papers that could remind people of how we got to where we are, how we got to the situation where people thought it was necessary to plant, to install that kind of furniture in such an overt and nasty way, and why there were another bunch of people who thought, you can't get away with this, we're going to take the piss out of you. Lair's installation, Space Not Spikes, survived for quite some time. Kept counting about five days, five, six days. On the sixth day, I, somebody told me, oh, I think it's gone. I said, why is that? But there's a hell of a lot of blue foam left. <laughs> and just cool. Lair is part of a growing movement of artists and activists responding to hostile design, sometimes called defensive architecture. Do you know about hostile design where cities just create really horrible I know things. all yeah. about hostile design because yeah. I'm a yeah. skater. Good, good. <laughs> the introduction of studs along hard edges to stop people grinding skateboards. It's terrible. The segmented street benches to stop people lying down. So sheets of glass at 45 degrees that looked like they might break if you sat on them or lay against them. You take something that would otherwise be attractive and if used by skaters, Something that is a locus of sport and engagement and style development and all these great human things. And you just like put gross knobs where you can't even sit down on the thing anymore. In Osaka, there was literally a shower rail along the wall of a part of a district. If you slept there overnight, they would literally turn the showers on to remove people. I'm Roland Atkinson. I'm a chair in Inclusive Societies here at the University of Sheffield, and I also work in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning. Defensive architecture, I suppose, and the easiest way of thinking about that is to consider the use of design technologies and forms of architecture which are about excluding particular groups and populations. The most common group that we're talking about is the homeless. There's a social problem that hostile design is meant to solve. And it isn't the problem of homelessness or public nuisance as such. It's the problem that certain citizens who are also entitled to use the streets often feel excluded, uncomfortable or threatened in public spaces due to the presence of others. You know, we have to accept that there's a kind of potentially empowering aspect to some of this stuff. You know, it's about who has a right to the city and on on what terms. Skateboarders can be quite intimidating to older people. Young children and women might might feel more comfortable in spaces that traditionally they would not have felt comfortable in. Defensive architecture can be used as a less overt way of stopping people using city spaces in particular ways. Ways that others find threatening or simply off-putting. If you think about it, what are the alternatives? Explicit laws and the use of police? Telling people to just put up with it? It's not clear what the more moral or humane alternative is here. Victor Callister is another Londoner, and a very tolerant person. He's also... The Deputy Director at uh, Design Council CABE in London, um, and we are design advice providers. Victor has personal experience of defensive designing. The place that I live, I have a door that goes straight onto the street in East London. And um, the estate agent was very keen to make sure that I visited the street before nine o'clock in the morning. Uh, because that's before the drug addicts actually get up. So it's only after I'd bought the place and then realised that my front stoop was effectively occupied by drug addicts and people sleeping rough and shouting and screaming and having all kinds of dramas all day long. So the approach that was taken by the residents in the building that I sort of part own uh, was to uh, put in place uh, traditional railings um, along the stoop. So we excluded people from sitting by actually putting the railings and gates. And what can be a more reasonable, low-cost solution to a neighbourhood problem than defensive design? The result of that is that it did move people on because it wasn't a great space to sort of spend two or three hours waiting for your dealer to turn up. But eventually, as you move the problem around, more and more people get the same idea, displacing the problem to the next neighbourhood over, until finally you have a city that's trying to design out entire groups of people. Is that a solution to the social problem? Do we really want all our streets cleansed in this way? It's really clear that there are different 
ways of thinking about streets compared to an artificial street in a shopping centre. What's great about city streets is they absolutely have everything that's kind of grubby and slightly sort of disreputable that makes them the sort of streets that you want to kind of sit and have a coffee on. I would rather have a, a coffee in Fifth Street in Soho outside of Bar Italia than outside of any coffee shop in any shopping centre anywhere in the world. There is no question about that. And to me, it's always really interesting to see why developers are very happy to actually walk down streets and to be in streets on the way to their own private streets. But somehow they're uncomfortable about the kind of people that we'd find in an ordinary street actually being in their environment. Eventually we get back to Leia and other artists around Europe, Chicago and Los Angeles who started turning spikes and partitioned benches into beds and leaning rails into chairs. And the general public, whose interests these defensive designs were meant to protect, responded. Can you tell me a bit about the reaction to Space Not Spikes? The weird thing about that was how it kind of blew up. You know, I think it hit, I think it's what they call virality. Um, it's, it's one of those things you never, never quite expected because the next morning, uh, a street artist friend of ours called Stick he came down and he's formerly homeless. He's like, do you want some actual homeless people here to like use it? And I said, yeah. I wrote a piece up, sent it into an outfit called Little Adams, two and a half hours later. It's like, so I've turned into your personal manager now and you've got requests from, and he just listed the number of people who've got in touch with him. Everyone just picked up on it. The weirdest one is I was out filming months later in Bolivia and on the streets of La Paz, I'd picked up the equivalent of The Big Issue, which is a kind of magazine sold by homeless people and people who work on the street. Oh my God. <laughs> and it was in this magazine that was set up, you know, in La Paz, of all the places. And I was like, that's, that's soy mio. And it's just like, it immediately goes up to the guy and it's like, that's the thing. He's like, yeah. And I was like, what? <laughs> and so we just started having this conversation in, you know, my broken Spanish with the guy. I was like, what the hell? And what? He was saying, and a lot of people there were saying, was that you know it's it's something that touched a nerve, not just for something specific to London and Curtain Road, and that was what we were wanting to address. It touched a nerve in a kind of human level. It, I suppose, guilted people into thinking, oh gosh, that's us. I'm complicit in that. Perhaps one of the reasons that the public became so hostile to hostile design is how obviously these features of the street sucked in Nick Riggle's sense of the term. It wasn't just the homeless or drug users or skaters that looked like they were being controlled by the built environment. Leia Borromeo's street art activism is a direct response to more general tendencies that everyone seemed to be noticing about the urban environment. Dr. Roland Atkinson. You know, a lot of what we're talking about in terms of defensive architecture actually is the production of very sterile, cleanable sort of space that offers no points of accommodation to anyone full stop with buildings which go down to ground level with no shop front, with no recesses, with no space, with no benches and all the rest of it. That in itself is another form of design which is hostile to social encounter, to people resting, to people finding a place in the city. And almost that's as, as big a problem as the the more overt forms of defensive architecture. We see increasing securitization, and a lot of that is also pushed by the insurance industry who want to ensure that that places are safe, that they're not, a, that they're not in any sense a risk in insurance terms. And all of those interests kind of combine in what we call the privatization of public space. And I think those things have a quite subtle effect as well, that you know it changes people's behavior, that they adopt a greater sort of pacified, consuming sort of uh, role when they're in those kind of spaces as a, as a result. Design, as philosophers would say, is teleological. It has a goal or end in mind, an aim. The aim can be awesomeness or the enhancement of social relationships of bonding and mutual appreciation. Or it can suck. In modern cases, it can feel like blatant attempts to limit human behavior to working or shopping, the only two activities of human value that make sense to private industries. But as much as the rest of the affluent may despise urban designers for works that reduce us to workers and shoppers, 
hostile design can have far more severe implications for the homeless and vulnerable. Excluded, vulnerable, marginal people find that there is literally no space for them in the city. Now, when I was a student in London, you could walk from Waterloo Station to the South Bank and pass through underpasses where there were, uh, you know, sort of cavernous places underneath the arches where homeless people were congregating. You'd see fires and oil drums burning and people sort of kipping down for the night and so on. All that interstitial space has literally been designed out. One thing that people with homes and jobs take for granted is their right to use the toilet, their right to sleep, and their right to wash themselves when they're dirty. These are the most basic functions that humans need to perform to survive. But these things are not in fact legal rights. In fact, if you think about it, we give wild and domesticated animals more rights than people to perform their basic bodily functions. If I walked my dog in New York City, she could go almost everywhere she chose. If I needed to use the toilet, I'd need to purchase something from a business, or I'd have to get their explicit permission, which you almost never get. The philosopher Jeremy Waldron pointed out in two famous papers on homelessness that almost everything we do as people has to be done somewhere, in some place. And in a modern society, there are two kinds of places, public places and private places. When I privately own a space... No one has the right to the use of my private property without my permission. You have no freedom to use my private spaces, even if you desperately need them for your basic human functions like sleeping. Homeless people don't have any such private property. Those of us who have rights to private property have at least one place where we can perform these basic functions. We are free to sleep in our homes, and our freedom to sleep in our homes is not dependent on the will of others to let us do this. Homeless people don't have freedoms like this. There's nowhere that they have the right to sleep. And so there's nowhere that they are free to sleep that isn't dependent on the will of others to let them sleep. Unless the homeless have the freedom to sleep in public. What hostile design does is create an environment that makes it impossible for the homeless to perform the most basic acts of human functioning in the only spaces they are legally allowed to do it. What these designs do is make privately owned spaces the only ones where a person can perform the basic functions that are needed for human beings to survive. A city that employs hostile design makes it so that the freedom to sleep, wash, and use the toilet must always be purchased. Waldron calls this, and I quote, the most callous and tyrannical exercises of power in modern times by a rich and complacent majority against a minority of their less fortunate human beings. Waldron was talking about legislating to prevent sleeping or urination in public spaces. These kind of laws, in effect, deny people the kind of freedom that a human being needs to survive. In many ways, hostile design can be more insidious than legislation. With legislation, people can still physically sleep or urinate. They simply face potential legal repercussions. With hostile design, you are using the power of the state to make the environment itself deny a person the ability to do the simplest things they need to prevent their own suffering. It's a way that the state is treating human beings as vermin. City life is normally built around preventing wild animals from performing their life function in a way that intrudes on the desires of humans. Almost every construction in a city is hostile to the survival of local wildlife. We are now designing our cities to be hostile to people. There's obviously another side to this problem. The tax-paying public wishes to use public spaces in certain ways that the homeless, skaters and loiterers threaten. And these members of society seem to have as much of a right to public space as the others. Why isn't hostile design the least evil and least costly solution to a genuine problem? Waldron sees an analogy between the problem of homelessness and the problem of free speech. People find the homeless, skaters, and loiterers threatening and offensive. But so too do people find speech that they seriously disagree with offensive. The correct response in the case of free speech in a liberal society is to welcome and value it, and to learn from it, not to erect barriers to its expression. In the case of homeless people, openly sleeping or begging on the street, people who find it offensive should be grateful that they're made aware of a social problem that they're in a position to solve. The problem is not that there are offensive people on the street, but that there are problems of poverty and mental health. 
But still, ordinary citizens claim a right to use public space in the ways that they see fit. And skating, panhandling, and loitering seem to preclude them. What's wrong with empowering taxpaying citizens from taking control of the streets? You can actually view it two ways. You can design a space in the interest of those who pay. These are the people who own private property and pay taxes that go to the maintenance of public places. This way of looking at the ethics of design puts the rights of those who pay over the rights of those who don't. And that's a question that goes to the very heart of what it means to be a public space. If you think that public spaces are just another space that privileges owners of private spaces and private property, then in what sense are they public, rather than just an extension of private property rights? The more you have privately, the more your right to determine the public space. But although Waldron thinks that it's natural to design public spaces to be the complement of private spaces, public spaces might need to serve the interests of those who don't have private spaces of their own too. Homeless people without private spaces need some public space in order to perform the basic functions that we all need to survive. The lesson from Waldron is that those of us who never have to worry about where to sleep, where to wash, and where to use the toilet should understand that these are actually privileges we've purchased in private spaces. If there aren't publicly available spaces for these activities, we aren't actually free to do these things until we've purchased the space where we do it. The more hostile design we permit in our environment, or the more laws we pass to prohibit behavior, the more we are limiting our freedom in public spaces. And for many people, this is not a nuisance or something that just sucks. It's a matter of survival. Richard Rowland is a philosopher at the Australian Catholic University in Melbourne, Australia. Nick Riggle's book is on Being Awesome, a unified theory of how not to suck, and it's out now on Penguin Books. Go to hivination.org for links to Leah Borromeo's Space Not Spikes exhibit and for Jeremy Waldron's papers on homelessness. This episode was inspired by an episode on hostile design that they did over at 99% Invisible podcast about design. Hi-Fi Nation is now a proud member of Hub & Spoke, a Boston-based collective of idea-based podcasts. If you want something else to listen to, try Ministry of Ideas, produced out of Harvard Divinity School and hosted by Zachary Davis. The entire first season of the show is out now, wherever you get your podcasts. This episode was written and produced by me and Richard Rowland, production assistants by Tabriz Lotti and Jake Johnson. Keep spreading the word about Hi-Fi Nation and stay subscribed. Another episode will be out next month.